This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Hallelujah. I pray that the Lord will give you ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Our text is coming from Matthew chapter 21, verse 1 through 7 from the modern English version of Scripture. Notice there these words. That when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go over into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a coat with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you say, The Lord has need of them. He will send them immediately. And this was done to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you humble and sitting on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the donkey and the colt and laid their garments on them, and he sat on them. I want to talk today from the subject, a new ride, a new, a new ride. I mean, everybody... Uh, has to have a, a ride. Uh, we've been riding for a long time. We didn't just start riding when we had automobiles. We, they were riding when they rode mules and donkeys, when they were riding cows and camels, when they were riding uh, horses. They, we've always found something to ride. We're going to hop on something's back to give us a better mode of, of transportation. We always had a ride, whether it was Noah who built an ark which was a boat, which is a ride on the water. God has always been able to provide a, a, a ride for us so that it gives relief to our feet. And so as we talk here about this new ride, I, I pray that God will give you spiritual ears because it's a prophetic message and, and my notes are really sketchy. Uh, it, it is amazing here how uh, Jesus chose to ride on a colt a, a, a colt is an uncastrated male donkey or horse. And it was a colt, it, it was a baby, it was one that had never been ridden. And Jesus said, I want you to go there and get the colt, get the thing that has never been ridden because I want to ride what has never been ridden before. I want a, I want a brand new ride. I, I want the new car smell. He was saying, I want a, a new ride because I'm, I'm going somewhere. But you might wonder why he didn't choose to ride on a horse. You know, I mean, when you're smelling yourself, you want, you want a stallion. But he didn't choose a horse. A horse uh, is a symbol of majesty. It is a symbol of power. It is a symbol of speed, and it is also a, a beast of war. And remember, Jesus is the prince of peace. So he didn't want to come on something that symbolized war. And he didn't want to come in, in that that symbolized majesty and power, though he is a king. He is a king, but he chose to come on a slow donkey. Something that was humble, that was down to earth. And it, it, it really highlighted who Jesus himself was. Because he chose to ride a young donkey that had never been ridden before. One that you got to break in. One that you, you've got to train how to turn to the left and how to turn to the right. One who you have to train how to hear your voice. Because when Jesus chooses you, we don't automatically just know how to follow him in every little thing. He has to teach you how to follow his voice. But he wanted a, a young donkey that had never been ridden before. And, and I want you to see that Jesus is teaching us a principle here is don't let where you are change who you are in Christ. 
Don't let where you are change who you are in Christ. Uh, uh, you see, because here's the, here's the, the deal. True rich, richness is not determined by how much you have, but by how little you need. When you really are rolling with Jesus Christ, you don't need a whole lot to be happy. This is why Paul said, in whatever state I find myself, I've learned therewith to be content. Uh, he said, I know how to abase, how to humble myself and get by on a little bit, and I know how to abound. That when I'm extended privilege and I got a, a stimulus check, I know how to big ball. I know how to order high on the menu. But he says, I also know how to, how to roll when I don't have but $5 and I'm trying to eat off the, off the menu. I know how to roll in both circumstances. When you roll with Jesus, you got to be all right whether you can afford a steak with lobster on top of it. Or whether you 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 gotta you gotta get something from Taco Bell, uh, three four dollar whatever it is. And he says, I, I know how to abase and I know how to to abound. I, I know how to to go low. Jesus was saying, you gotta learn how to be able to ride lowly. He's meek and low. He didn't come riding on a high horse. He came on a on a slow donkey. And it spoke of his humility because Jesus' confidence was in his father and not in his ride. Uh, his confidence is what God had put in him, not what was on him. And it wasn't based even on uh, what he was on. You see, women oftentimes are impressed by looking to see what a man drives instead of looking to see what drives the man. And Jesus, Jesus, Jesus was saying, you know, I, I, I want you to start looking not at what he drives or what she drives. Look and see what drives the person. See if that is godly. See if that is lofty. See if that is going to be something that's going to roll well in your relationship with them. Don't look to see what they drive. Look to see what's driving them. And so here, the horse represents incredible speed, but Jesus is in no hurry. Just think about it. Whenever you pray to God, you know, God is never coming to you running because God's never in a hurry. You will never, ever hear panic in God's voice and if you do my God if God starts freaking out <laughs> what are we supposed to do I mean do you think that something could happen somebody could leave you die in this world and then God said Ooh. <laughs> oops like he didn't see that coming he knows everything nothing can sneak up on God he's God God is omniscient he's all-knowing so he's never in a hurry, may I say this to you, hurry is of the devil. Hurry is the devil. Because when you're in a hurry, it makes you choppy and nasty with people. Hurry is the devil, but when you're patient, patient is the fruit of the, the Holy Ghost. It's the fruit of the Spirit of God being with you and in you when you're able to just chill out. Whenever you get in a hurry, you get snappy with people. You say things in a way that becomes offensive and hurtful to them. But when you are on a donkey, Jesus is saying, you know, I'm Lord. Even if it's dead, when I get there, I got the power to raise it. How can God be late? He is time. Yet he's not subject to it. He's the God who was, who is, and is to come. And he says, just bring it on. But Jesus asked for a donkey, not a, not a stallion. He didn't ask for a stallion. May I tell you why? The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, a spiritually gifted church, people flowing in the gifts of God, the Apostle Paul writes to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29. Notice what he says. 
Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you, few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. God does call some powerful people and some wealthy people and some smart people, but he says few of you were wise in this world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the thing the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise and he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful then notice God chose things despised by the world things considered as nothing at all and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important and then notice this, as a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. No flesh can glory in his presence. God says, I want to be able to do this in such a way where they say, you know what, I know so-and-so's IQ. That was God. <laughs> Have you ever had the glory of God to come on you and empower you to be able to do something? It's amazing. I see people scared to death, nervous, asking God, Jesus, please help me. Jesus, please help me. Jesus, please. And then when they come out there and God is with them, and, and, and I mean, and they just slam it. And then they, they be like, yeah, 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 I did it. Yeah, yeah. But God says, I want to be able to choose people who are in a low place and take them to a high place that they couldn't get by themselves. And people are going to know. It is not your background. It's not who your mom and your daddy was. It's not where you went to school. They're gonna, you're going to know, God says, I, I, I want to be able to use them in such a way. Bless them in such a way where they realize this is the Lord's doing. What God did for you. You can be trying to promote something and God will give you free word of mouth advertisement in the mouths of people. I'm telling you, God can put your name on people's lips that you may not even know that will be promoting. It is a part of the glory of God and God is saying, I'm doing something on your behalf. I'm working. I'm a wind beneath your, your wings when you can't even see me coming. But I'm working in such a way that no flesh will be able to glory in God's presence and say, hey, I did this. God wanted to say, I want to use them. I want to bring you into the positions. I want to put my favor on you where they know this is not about the frat that you are part of or the sorority, which school you went to, where you, who your hometown, who your mama was, who your daddy was, your brother, your sister, the amount of money that you had in the bank, what your stock portfolio looked like, how much cryptocurrency you own. God says, I want to be able to do something and move through you in such a divine and supernatural way where they realize this is only God because had Jesus ridden in on a horse they would have sworn that his majesty was because of how regal the horse carried himself to where you just look like a king but when you are confident in who you are you don't have to fix up in order to be accepted you ever see these really super rich dudes? You will not see them advertising Louis Vuitton and Cartier and all of this kind of stuff. They'd be in some jeans and a t-shirt. You won't even know they have money. Because when you've got something and you know you've got something, you don't have to prove it to anybody by your bling bling. It's amazing and I want you to see here I just want you to see the one one of the reasons that I have a trouble delivering messages like this is because it's revelatory of the Holy Ghost uh, Jesus sent his two disciples and said go there and you're gonna find a donkey and a coat tied he said untie them and bring them here and tell them the master hath need of them I want you to understand that this is a prophetic picture of Jesus coming into our world and then using people who have never been used by God before. People that have never been ridden. No wonder, no wonder there is a rumbling and a moving of the Holy Ghost on university campuses right now. 
He, he didn't choose to go into nursing homes yet. But he's gone into the university systems. And it's been spreading from one campus to another to another and they've been having some overflow divinely by the Holy Ghost of people that have never experienced a true revival move of God. God says, I want to ride something that has never felt my presence on their back. I want to go to that generation. This is a picture of Jesus. And, and, and I want you to understand that it's, it's not, he uh, it, it said, you're going to find the donkey. That's the mama to the colt. It's the mama to the colt. It is Jesus said, I'm going to bring both the old and the new. He didn't make a choice between them because he's not trying to split up the family. He wants the whole family to come connected. Jesus doesn't want your family to be jacked up because you have come to know him. In fact, the method of the gospel is that he'll save you and your household. Lydia believed on the Lord Jesus. He saved her and her house, her husband, her children, everything under her roof. And Jesus said, I, I'm not making a choice here. He says, bring both of them. I want you to understand that the mother donkey, the mother, the mother, the female donkey, every time that you see a female in the church, most times she is a picture of the church. And here's the church that's got the youth tied up. My God. And they are gifted. And they are waiting to be ridden because they have never had a move of God. But God says, I'm getting ready to ride what has never been ridden before. And he says, I'm, I'm, I'm sending some disciples in to loose the church and the young folks in the church. He says, they belong to me. They belong to me. They belong to me. Every time that God has ever done a revolution in the earth, it always happens through young people. Always without exception. There might be old heads that help to guide it, but the real foots soldiers are always young people when he started moving in social justice back in the 50s it was by a 25 year old martin luther king jr 25 years old 25 years old december the 1st 1955 when rosa parks sat out on a bus and refused to give up her seat it was a 25 year old who stepped on the platform of america and began to embarrass america for her injustice it was God riding on what had never had a move of God with Jesus riding on his back. It was bigger than a man. It was the king of glory that was riding in on the man. And I'm just here to remind you today that Jesus is ready to ride what has never been ridden before. To put his spirit on it and to move through what has never ever been been written notice what he said in luke chapter 19 and verse 30 talking about the same thing go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it you'll find a coat tied there which no one has ever ridden i want to ride what has not been written he says untie it and bring it here two things stand out about what jesus chose to ride two things stand out about what jesus chose to ride number one it was bound and had to be loosed it was bound and had to be loosed. I know we got young people that's got some issues. Some of them are bound by pornography and bound by addiction to, to, to technology. And they, they, they've got addictions to drugs and alcohol and all kinds of craziness and dealing with depression and anxiety. Jesus said, I'm going to send disciples. He's always sent them by two. He sent them by two. He sent them by two. When they got in the ark to save them, he sent them by two. Male and female, he sent them by two. He sent them by two. Over in Revelation, you find these dual witnesses that are coming, and, 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 and then one is slain in the street, and he always sent them by two. Two is the number of multiplication. He sent them by two, and he said, both of you all, go, go there, and you're going to find this colt. It's never been ridden before, but it's bound, but I need you to loose it. I don't want you to judge it. I want you to loose it. I don't want you to judge it. I want you to loose it. Now, you might wonder, why is it that Jesus himself didn't go and loose the donkey? Why didn't he go? Because he gave power to us to go and to loose. When he was on the earth, I mean, he did the loosing. But then he turned to us and said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. 
They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They shall cast out devils. If they take up any dead thing, it shall not hurt them. He said, this is your assignment. Jesus, when he was on the cross and he said, it is finished, it was finished for him. Now it's our turn. He's saying, tag you it. You're a disciple, there are some folks that you got to loose. Jesus is not coming and doing it without you. He's going to do it through you. He's going to do it with you. But he's going to do the loosing through you. And so I want you to see that they were bound. They were bound and, and had to be loosed or untied. Remember this principle. You never cut what you have the power to untie. Never cut what you have the power to untie. Wouldn't it be crazy if you tied your tennis shoes and then every time you got ready to take them off, you took scissors and just went right down the front of them, just cut them, cut them loose in order to get out of them? Never cut what you have the power to un, untie. Jesus said, go and untie them. Untie them. Untie them. Untie them, U-N-T-I-E, so that you can switch the letters around and U-N-I-T-E, unite. You can't unite a husband and a wife until you untie the issues. You, you, you can't become one with somebody when you got knots in you. He said, untie, untie, then you can unite. Untie and then you unite. So Jesus uses disciples to go into loose bound people. Bound people. Jesus longs to ride people who've been bound. Drugs, alcohol, perverted sex lives, all kinds of addiction. He loves folks who've been bound, who are bound. Do you think that your being bound disqualifies God from riding you? No, no, no. He says, no, no, no. Go, go to them. Loose them and let them know I want to ride them. Loose them and let them know the master. Listen, listen. He didn't say, I want them. He said, I need them. Tell them, if anybody asks you, tell them the master has need of you. Touch somebody and say, Jesus needs you. Now, I know God knows we need Jesus. Now, that, that's not a question. That is not the question whether or not we need, we know we need Jesus, but Jesus needs us. He's not going to do it without us. He's looking for folks whose paths are so jacked up, who are so messed up. How dare, how dare you assume that because of all of the devilment that you have done, all of your little trickery and deception and lies have disqualified you from God using you in the future. Really? Just because you messed up, made bad decisions, and have had pure character in the past? You just want to send somebody to loose you first. And then Jesus is going to hop on your back. He wants to save you, loose you. And then he will hop on your back, no questions asked. And then the second thing that happened is that garments were laid on it. Garments was laid. It was bound and had to be loose. That was done by the disciples. But then garments were laid on it. Garments. You know why? Because Jesus is the Christ. The Christos. It means the anointed one and his anointings. So here comes the anointed one and his anointings, and he's going to get on a donkey. But here's, here's the principle. The reason that they had to throw claws over the backs of the donkey is because Jesus never anoints flesh. He never anoints flesh. He never anoints flesh. What does he do with flesh? He puts blood on it. If you ever go back into the Old Testament, you'll discover the priests were informed when, the, the, when they took the priest and they got ready to deal with the priest, they took blood, the blood of, of an animal, and put it on the right ear of the priest, the right thumb of the priest, and the right big toe. They put blood on his flesh, on the ear, on the thumb, on the big toe. So blood, so you've got a covenant with God now that you can hear right. Blood on the thumb so that the works of your hand so you can do right. And blood on the big toe so you can walk right. He put blood there. You need blood to break the curse. The blood breaks the curse. The blood breaks the curse. I know your flesh has been jacked up and doing all kind of feel-good kind of stuff. The blood of Jesus. You need the blood 
to deal with your flesh. You need the blood. The blood was shed for the sins of your flesh. But then the anointing, the only thing that the, that the anointing oil came on was the head, which was God's way of talking about divine headship and authority. Divine, ordained by God. The rest of all of the oil came on the beard, still headship representing maturity because boys don't grow beards. Maturity. God doesn't want to anoint something that is immature because it's egotistical. So he comes on maturity. And then it comes down to the garment. And even to the skirts of the garment. All of the anointing oil drips on the garment. It is God's way of saying, I'll anoint the position, the office that I call you to. It's not about you. Don't you get the big head. I realize I am just a person here because when I'm gone, there'll be another person that God will anoint to stand in my place. It's his church. It is his church. And he anoints and calls whoever he wants to be here. And I'm just here as an interim pastor. It's just my season now. It's not anything that I did, it's what he did. It's his church. And he's the one that will change and put the oil not on the on the flesh that dies but on the garment it is on the garment that they wear that carries the anointing because God doesn't anoint flesh and that's why you can never assume that when you see a person anointing anointed that it is an endorsement of their character because he anoints the position because he wants to deliver his people it's just a matter of how God moves and so Jesus chose to ride on a low and meek donkey because whenever you change your clothes, the change of clothes is a sign of the change of your role. If you work in a uniform all day, when you get home, the first thing that you do is come out of their clothes. You want to put on your clothes. You don't want to walk around with your post office uniform on, with your restaurant uniform on. You want to get out of those Clothes. You want to put on your clothes. A change of clothes is a change of role. They put clothes, cloths, c covers on the donkey. Covers. I want you to notice something in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 through 10. Notice this. On the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share the Lord's Supper. And Paul was preaching to them. And since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking unto midnight. That's a long time. The upstairs room where we met was lighted with many flickering lamps. And as Paul spoke on and on, Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill became very drowsy. I mean, if you talk to midnight, I'll get drowsy too. <laughs> Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. And Paul went down and bent over him and took him into his arms. Paul says, don't worry, he's alive. Don't worry, he said, he's alive. Here's Eutychus. The name Eutychus means lucky or fortunate. He's a young man. He's a teenager. He's an adolescent. He's sitting there up on the third story with them where Paul was preaching in a room. And he got drowsy because he couldn't understand what Paul was talking about. And mind you, that people would say, I wish I could preach like Paul. Paul was the best of his day. And a young man who couldn't understand what the best preacher was preaching fell asleep during the sermon and fell out of the window the way that the millennial generation fell out of the church. Because they misunderstood the message that Paul was bringing and they fell three stories the one story that back down to the ground level which is where you are that's where you are the, the, the first story is where your mom and daddy is and the third story up there is where your grandparents are everything that God does he's gonna do in something that's bigger than you and he had to send somebody from the third floor to come back down to the first floor to pick him up and he says, he's all right. 
he's going to be all right. And a miracle ensued because God will confirm the word, even though you don't understand it, but he'll confirm it with signs and wonders following. And Eutychus, Eutychus is a type of a, a generation that fell out of the church in disfavor with the church in their eyes and fell out. They got drowsy, fell asleep, and then fell out of the church. And Paul now comes down, takes him up in his arm, not in judgment, but in compassion. He says, come on back home, come on, come back with us. And there he came back, and he went upstairs. They went back up to the third floor, not the first and second. He went back to the top floor, and they took communion. And I'm telling you, this is a time now to connect, to commune, and to communicate. This is a time where God is saying, I want you to come. This is where you don't understand. Uh, that, uh, this, is, this is a Jacob that's not understanding what Isaac represented and what Abraham un uh, represented. And so now here Abraham comes and has to pick up Jacob. The blessing that was, the promise that was given to Abraham was actually fulfilled in Jacob. Because Abraham only had one son of promise. Isaac had two. But in Jacob, he had 12, and that's where the nation was born. Because a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. It's the third story. The man fell three stories. It is the same way that when the apostle Paul meets young Timothy, here's Timothy here, and, and, and here he begins to tell him, he says, Timothy, he says, I, I, I know the faith that was in your mother Eunice, and it was also in your grandmother Lois. I perceive that it's also in you, Timothy. But it took Paul, a spiritual father, to be able to tell him, stir up the gift of God that is on the inside of you. Because the master hath need of you. He needs you. I hope you hear the Holy Ghost today. He's coming after a generation that has felt disqualified because you've been distracted with video games and distracted with internet addiction and distracted with anxiety and comparison and low self-esteem and feelings of inadequacy. But Jesus said, I want you to go and untie them. Tell them the master has need of them. He has need of you. Tied it up, pierce, pink hair, green hair, blue hair. He has need of you. You've been cutting yourself. He has need of you. You've been money hungry, chasing the wrong kinds of things. Jesus has need of you. Touch somebody and say, let him ride, let him ride, let him ride. The Holy Ghost has just been riding me every day this week. Just waking me up in the morning and said, get up, let me show you this. Let me show you something else he showed me in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. Notice this, above him were seraphim. You know what a seraphim is, an angel. It's a baby angel. And each with six wings, six wings, six wings. With two they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. Can I unpack that for you for just a moment? Just go back to verse 2 again. Each with six wings, with two wings, they covered their faces. Hidden identity. We got a generation, they don't know who they are. Hidden identity. But you're an angel, and you don't even know it. You're an angel. With two wings, they covered their face. And with two wings, they covered their feet. Hidden destination. Hidden destination. And with two wings, they were flying. Now, let me put it all together for you. Here people with two wings with their faces covered, not knowing who they are, not knowing where they're going, but they're flying to get there. And notice, notice verse 3, notice verse 3, and they were calling to one another. When you don't know what else to do, just call to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the whole earth. The whole earth, the whole earth is full. The terra firma is full of his glory. It is full of his glory. He says, declare it before you see it. You release glory out of your mouth. 
begin to declare it. The glory is in my house. Glory is in my children. Glory is in my school system. Glory is in my neighborhood. Glory is in my apartment complex. Glory is in my department on the job. Glory, release the glory. You're carriers of the glory. Your glory producers, open your mouth and give God the glory. Maybe this is somewhat similar to Paul Revere's midnight ride. Where he was riding through the city, alerting everybody that the British were coming. But these were particular angels that were on a mission to declare the holiness of the Lord. And when the world becomes very unholy, they need somebody to remind the earth that the Lord is holy, 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 holy. Only God is holy. Only God is holy. Only God, only God is holy. Only God is holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. And we're called to carry carry the glory but when a king chooses to ride a donkey it does not diminish the status of the king it elevates the glory of the donkey because of what's on his back it's the glory it's the glory it's the glory the passenger of king jesus remains the same the vehicle changes it's just a mode of transportation that's a variable whether it's a donkey a colt that's a variable. It's a mode of transportation. It's how God will get you from point A to point B. But Jesus still needs donkeys to ride. And there are people that I know who want to give you the reasons as to why God can't ride them. Great people like Moses that said, Lord, I don't speak well. You, 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 you my brother because his stuttering made him insecure. God was like, I want, no, 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 Moses, I'm going to use your mouth. Your, may, your mouth may not be on point with me yet, but just walk with me, ride with me. Let me get on your back and ride you and I'll straighten your mouth out on the journey. And remember, Moses was also not just a stutterer. No, Moses was a murderer. He had killed a man trying to do social justice without the Holy Ghost. When you try to do the agenda of God without God, it, there is no justice without God. We're not into humanistic justice. Because, listen to it, when you think that it's justice, just us, it's not just us. We're carrying a king on our back. And he loves them, red, yellow, black, and white. They're all precious and beautiful in his sight. If you're going to have the king... He's not going to have schism in his family. If you got a problem with anybody else that Jesus has invited to the family table, then your invitation may be revoked. You could find yourself blotted out. There were people that God wanted to use and they did stupid stuff. Noah got drunk. I mean, wasted. I mean, stripped all his clothes off. He was sloppy drunk, delirious, oblivious. Gideon suffered with low self-esteem, but God wanted to ride him. Thomas was a, was a doubter. Martha, she was a warrior. Peter had a bad temper. Elijah was depressed and had suicide ideation. And yet God said, I'm going to use you. David had an affair. An adulterer. God said, I'm going to use your boy. Jacob was a cheater. Get this, young ladies. Rahab was a prostitute. She's in the heritage of Jesus. She's one of his ancestors. She was flawed, but God said, I'm going to use her for my glory. I know who she's been sleeping with, but I'm getting ready to ride 
on her with my presence and my glory and I'm going to use her and it's not going to be about it. They're going to realize it's who is on her. Don't let what you've done disqualify you. You are not what you have done. You are what you have overcome. May I remind you of this? The past does not define you. It prepares you. The past does not define you. It prepares you. The past does not define you. It prepares you. So what's your excuse? Can God use imperfect people? He has no other kind that he can use. And he wanted to ride something that was already bound. And if you remember in Numbers chapter 22, Balaam the prophet is riding on a donkey. And the donkey starts talking to him because God is talking to him through a donkey. Now, if God could speak through a literal donkey, you see where I'm going? <laughs> Can he not speak through, speak through you? You may not feel like a stallion, but Jesus didn't choose the stallion. He chose the low donkey. And he'll ride a colt. It's a new generation that has never experienced a revival move of the Holy Ghost. They've never experienced Jesus on their back, and now he's putting a hunger in their belly. If you'll get a hunger in your belly, he'll ride your back. And Jesus asked for both the donkey and the colt. He asked for the mother and the child. It wasn't one or the other. He asked for both. And I'm telling you, the mother here is a picture of the church. And he says, I want both of you. I want the church with its young people, its evangelistic force being turned loose. Jesus started rotting me when I was 14 years old, 14. And when he rode me, he rode right into my high school of 2,000 students where I proclaimed the gospel to all 2,000 of those students for the rest of the time that I was there. He was riding a 14-year-old a 14 year old who had never been ridden before. He came down to ride a 14 year old. And during those teenage years, I was teaching in three separate Bible studies in three separate locations and going to a prison with 2,000 inmates every single month and going to four different nursing homes, riding on the back of a teenager. It has nothing to say about me. I didn't do it because I wanted to do it. I'm an introvert. I'm shy. How dare you? <laughs> Rod me and make me uncomfortable to get in front of people and I'm shy and introverted. But for your glory, Lord, you have such an amazing sense of humor. It's for your glory. And by the way, when you're an introvert and when you're shy, you never fully grow out of it. I will go places and speak to thousands. And as soon as I'm finished, I'm back in my room because I recharge in solitude. I'm an introvert. For real, for real. <laughs> but I'm willing to let the king rod me and open and speak through the mouth of a donkey will you let him speak through you because he's looking for all the time a new ride can I tell you this when you get a new ride the excitement of your new ride begins to dwindle after about a week or two I mean the first few days you had that washing it every day and <laughs> polishing getting a little every little speck off here but by the time you're in the second or third month, you're like, shoot, you know, you know mud splattered all on the side of it. <laughs> but if you get a new ride, there's a new enthusiasm that comes with a new ride. One reason that I believe that 
Jesus asked for both the mother and her baby. It's because as Jesus was explaining a parable in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 52, he was giving them a parable of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said that this person out of their treasure, they bring things old and new. That he will use both the old and the new. He doesn't distinguish them here, the old and the new. Who in their right mind would throw away old money just because you get new money? It's a treasure. Let them grow up both together. That's all that he's saying. It's a picture of both the young and the old. But he chose to ride the waves of change on the younger one. But he says, bring the mother too. Bring the church too. Don't do it without the church. Jesus died for the church. He loved the church. It's his bride comes out of the church. It's amazing. And here's what I want you to see. In a deep dive, I'll just take you through some of my time of just the manna that fell to me this week. Because the manna would fall with the children of Israel, it, it fell early in the morning. And I declare to you, if you'll get up early in the morning, there's low-hanging fruit. The manna from heaven falls early in the morning. And it's interesting that in Joshua chapter 5 and verse 12, It uses these simple words, and the manna ceased, and the manna ceased. Do you know why the manna stopped? It stopped because, you know, the children of Israel had been a transient people. They were nomads. They had been walking for 40 years in the wilderness. So. They walked so that everybody over 20 years old died in the wilderness. So there was a whole generation of desert babies. Are you listening? Who were 20 and under that had been born in the wilderness. And all of the old folks that had been in Egypt, they walked until all of them died so that he could take a new generation in. But when they got right to the border of the land of Canaan, the scripture says, and the manna ceased. It was how this, that generation had been fed their whole lives by manna. But now he brought them to establish them in a land and to give them a land. And so they had to become now not a transient people, but an agricultural people. And the reason that I believe that he let the mother come with the with the baby the mama donkey now coming with her coat her baby male donkey is because all that the baby donkey had known was manna but the church had known what it was to be planted in a place and have to plant till the soil sow the seed and water they didn't know the process and the only reason that he brings the old with the young is because the young have lived on manners, everything provided for them. But he wanted somebody who has been tilling the soil, are you listening? And sowing the seed and being faithful to water when nothing was spectacular. To teach them the process and to show them the ropes. We call that discipleship. And he's bringing them into a picture of discipleship to say, you've been in my house and I've been paying all the bills and, and you've been leaving the lights on and the water dripping and you've been throwing away stuff out of the refrigerator before it was fully finished and you've been letting my food spoil. Now I'm going to teach you. You're going to have to go to the grocery store and pay for it. This one is on you. He said, Mama can only breast feed you for so long. That's the church. You desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. But after you get to a certain 
state, if you're still on milk and 20, 20 years old, you're going to deal with some deficiency issues. You're going to need some broccoli and some kale. The manna will cease. And when the manna ceases, you need somebody who knows how to till the soil, sow the seed, and water. It's time now for a fresh move of God. And he's looking for somebody who has never experienced the Holy Ghost using you, simply making yourself available and saying, Lord, here am I. Send me. And who are you, disciple of Christ? It's not enough to just sit around and look at young people and say, my goodness, what is the world coming to? It's coming to an end. What are you going to do about it? There are some people that need to be loosed because the king has need of them. It's time now for us to loose them and let them go so that King Jesus will have a new ride. I hope you got something out of the word of the Lord today. Hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb. While we're here, before we leave today, I want to ask you, if you're under 30 years old, to meet me here at the altar. I just want to pray a closing prayer. If you're under 30, you know why? Because in Jewish culture, in Jewish culture, in Jewish culture, you, you were not a full adult until you were 30 years old. Jesus wants to ride you. He wants to loose you and he wants to ride you. He wants to ride your TikTok and your Instagram. He wants to ride you. Your DMs, your text messages. Jesus wants to shake brosepaya. Oh my God. I didn't even know y'all could get up this early. I didn't know you were up this early. This feels like a miracle. <laughs> oh, glory, 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 glory. the worship team to come back for just a moment God is up to something that's all that I can tell you Jesus is up to something he's up to something I'm a watchman on the wall I know what time it is. I'm not guessing the time. I'm declaring to you in the name of Jesus, it's your time. It's your season. Scuprigedias. God's going to set a fire in your belly. Shekretamos. Some supernatural things. You watch what God will do. He'll come into your dreams, into your sleep at night while you're on the bed and open you up and give you divine revelation. Just sing a little bit of that. Now just open your heart. Just talk to Jesus right now before we pray. i 
with a heart, God, to be disciple, to be able to plant and to water and to reap for your glory. What you're starting them today, don't stop it. Ignite a fire on the inside of them, God, that is, cannot be quenched. We decree this in the name of Jesus. We release them into your divine order. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Come kingdom. Come kingdom of God. On earth as it is in heaven. Come kingdom. And king, may you come and ride upon these lives who avail themselves to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I know he's going to use you for his glory. He's not finished. He's not finished. There's some other folks you've been wanting God to use you. This is that season. This is that season. You've never felt his presence in a supernatural way. This is the season for it. To experience what you've never experienced before all of the days of your life. And let me just tell you this, your great power is not in where you're going, it's in where you've been. It's what he has delivered you from. There's glory in your story. There's a new platform that's getting ready to open up because somebody needs to hear what you have come out of. I know what it is because I had the devil when I was in my teen years to come in and try to make me kill myself. But God gave me a glimpse. God gave me a glimpse. The devil told me exactly how to do it. I was at home in my room. He came to me while I was all alone and said, take your life. He was trying to stop God's purpose and plan. What is he trying to stop in you? This is a new season. He's been trying to take you out, but the devil is alive. He let people walk out of your life, but God is going to do a miracle testimony strengthening you by his own glory by his own power this is a new season this is a new season this is a new season and i encourage you to go with god and allow the fire that he has stoke the fire ask god to just fan this thing send the wind it, it causes a spark to turn into a blaze and every place you go will experience the touch of god May God give you divine ideas, concepts as to how to make Jesus great as he rides on your life, as he rides on your life. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.